God, I want to thank you, Lord, just for who you are. I pray that today you can draw our attention in on you. Um, Lord, wherever we are in our walk with you, God, I pray that right now we can focus and that you can challenge us and that you can help transform us into the person you want us to be. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, by a show of hands, has anybody in this room ever been humiliated before? You've been like, humil- not just embarrassed, but like you've been humiliated ever before? Yeah, I don't know if maybe uh, sometime that you and your friend, there was something going on, but like, I mean, you and your friend were saying something and it got out and then it's like, that was just supposed to stay between us and then it humiliated you. Or I don't know if maybe your parents humiliated you in front of your crush before or in your class or anything, like they were there. Um, has anybody in this room ever humiliated themselves? Like you've humili- like you've, has anybody, okay, I don't know if this is true, but has anybody in this room ever like tripped into a puddle in front of people? Anybody done that? Yeah. I'm surprised there's that many people. Has anybody ever tripped going on stage before in front of a lot of people? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, humiliation uh, is embarrassing. I can tell you so many different stories of when I've been humiliated in my life. I don't have time uh, right now, so afterward, if you want to come ask me, I'll let you know. But I wanted to start off with this concept of humiliation because today... As we continue our exile series through the book of Daniel, we're going to read a story where King Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king we've been reading about so far, he gets humiliated, and he gets humiliated by God. And I would never want to be humiliated by God, and we're going to see just how God does that today. So if you have your Bible, I hope you do, because a lot of you grabbed it, open up to the book of Daniel. We're going to be in chapter 4, verse 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. If you're brand new to a Bible, you've never opened it before, uh, just open up to the table of contents at the beginning of the book. Look for the book of Daniel. It's in the Old Testament, toward the back. In my Bible, it's on page 806. Probably won't be in yours, but you could try it out. Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. Now, we've been in this series, series called Exiled for four weeks now. And the reason that we have called it exiled is because we've been reading about four different guys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. And all of them are following the Lord, but they live in Babylon, which is a place of people that are not worshiping the Lord. And because of that, they probably feel alone, and they probably feel exiled from everybody there. And we're looking at their lives because if we call ourselves Christians, the Bible says we are going to be different. And that means that we're probably going to feel exiled at times and we're going to feel alone at times because no one else around us is worshiping the Lord. And we're going to be looking at different principles and we have been looking at different principles in this uh, study so far that just help us in those situations. Now today though, as we dive into uh, Daniel chapter 4, we're kind of taking a break from this whole exile theme and we're just going to be looking at King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's going to pop up in the story, but we're going to focus in on King Nebuchadnezzar. His humiliation doesn't really fit this whole exile theme, but there's still things that we can learn today as we continue on. So I hope that you're there by now. We're going to start in 4-4, like I said, and here Nebuchadnezzar is actually writing this. It's a long story. We're not going to read it all. I'm going to skip around. I'll explain things as we go along, but uh, follow along in verse 4. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men in Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream. But they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. So we pick up right here where Nebuchadnezzar is a little bit tired, so he decides that he wants to go to sleep. And as he's sleeping, he has a dream that terrifies him. Now, has anybody had one of those dreams before where like you just woke up, you're terrified, maybe you're like sweating a little bit, you don't really know what's going on? This is the type of dream he's having. Now, the dream he's also having is one of those dreams where he feels like the dream he just had, like, means something. Like, there's a greater purpose. Like, it might be predicting something in the future. I don't know if you guys have had a dream like that where you're like, this can't just be a dream. This has to mean something. And this is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar um, had. So he calls in all the different people to interpret it for him. And the last person he calls in is Daniel. And it's funny that he calls him in last because in chapter 2, if you remember, Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
but now he calls Daniel in last after everybody else could not do it. So Daniel comes in, and Nebuchadnezzar goes on to tell Daniel what his dream was. Uh, Picking up in verse 10, it says, Here's my dream. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. So he starts off by saying, Daniel, my dream started off pretty good. I was having a nice, peaceful dream of this super tall tree. It was so tall that it touched the sky. There were many branches, many leaves. Birds would find shelter in it. Animals would find shelter in it. It would grow a lot of fruit. It was this nice tree, and everything was all good. But then he says, Daniel, here is where my dream started to get terrifying. In verse 13, it says, In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. So his dream goes from dreaming of this peaceful tree to all of a sudden an angel coming down from heaven just saying, cut down that tree, strip off its branches, get rid of its leaves, have the animals run away, scatter its fruit. And this is the part that started to terrify him because he felt like there was a greater purpose behind it. And then the angel who said all of that is all of a sudden going to change from talking about the tree to talking about a person. And a little spoiler alert, the angel is talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. And it says this as we continue in verse 15. It says, the angel says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animal or with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times, or most people think seven years, pass by for him. Jumping down to verse 18, it says, This is the dream that I had. Now, Daniel, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. So, Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, all of a sudden, the angel stopped talking about the tree. It started talking about a person. Can you tell me what this dream is about? The angel was saying to the person, go live out, go be like an animal for seven years. And he's like, what's up with this dream that I had? And Daniel, as we know, is very gifted. And Daniel, as we know, can interpret dreams. And Daniel is sad. And Daniel is perplexed. And he's afraid to tell Nebuchadnezzar what it's about. Because Daniel knows that this dream is about him. is about Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel knows that this dream is saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you are like that tree. You are tall. Your power is huge. Your might is enormous. You rule over Babylon. Like, you are big. And remember, he is this evil king. Remember so far, he's already ordered in the last chapter for four men, or three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to be thrown into a blazing furnace. In chapter two, he ordered for all the people that couldn't tell him what his dream was to be murdered. This is an evil guy, but he's still ruler of Babylon. And he's friends with Daniel, which is crazy. And Daniel says, I wish this dream was about your enemies, but Nebuchadnezzar, it is about you. Because your kingdom is going to be stripped from you. You are going to be cut down. And you are going to go out and you are going to live like an animal. And that's what it says here as we pick up in verse 25. Daniel says, You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you, or seven years, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. And I'd underline this part if you mark up your Bible. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. 
It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, this dream is about you. It's saying that you are going to be stripped of your power. You're going to go out into the wild. You are going to live like an animal. And that had to have been terrifying for him. Like, seriously? Do you know how successful I am? Do you know how powerful I am? Do you know how many people must respect me and must honor me? Yeah, but your, your kingdom's going to be stripped from you. You're going to have to go live like a wild animal. But then Daniel says, but Nebuchadnezzar, if you just start doing what is right, stop sinning and start being kind to the oppressed, start being kind to those people that are under you, that are kind of ostracized in society, start being kind to them, and then just maybe none of this will happen to you. Then maybe your kingdom will stay for the next seven years. He said in seven years your kingdom will come again, it will be restored, but maybe you don't have to go through any of this humiliation of losing your kingdom. And then it says this, though, in verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The Bible just told us that God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar for 12 months. He said, your kingdom does not have to be stripped from you potentially if you just start doing what is right. But Nebuchadnezzar blew off God and he didn't listen to God. And the reason why is because he felt like he didn't need God. You see, he was very prideful. He was very arrogant. He thought it was all about him. But as we're going to see soon, God's going to show him it's not all about you. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he struggled with arrogance. And he, was, he didn't just struggle with it. He was an arrogant person. He was very prideful, and that is going to be his downfall as we are going to see. And I want to just pause through the story. We're going to pick it up in the next few minutes, and we're going to see what happens. But I want to talk about this concept of arrogance, because that is why he fell, was because he was arrogant. And when we read in the Bible um, the word pride, oftentimes we can replace it with the word arrogance. Because, you know, pride can be a good thing, it's, it can be a bad thing, but arrogance is always a bad thing. Like if I said, Philip, you're so arrogant, is he going to take that as a compliment? No, he's not. It's always bad to be described as arrogant. So I want you guys to understand this. First thing to write down is that God hates arrogance. God hates arrogance. Now, hate is a strong word, right? You guys would all agree with that. I hate cheese, okay? I've shared that up here. I hate cheese. I wish cheese didn't exist. I wish I could murder it, but it is not a thing. It's just a substance or a food, so I can't. <laughs> but I hate cheese a lot. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hate is a strong word. God hates arrogance. It says this straight up in Proverbs 8.13. God says, I hate pride and arrogance. All right, just flat out says it. And then in Proverbs 15.25, it says, the Lord tears down the house of the proud. That means the Lord attacks the prideful, the go that God attacks the arrogant. So we just read God's, God hates arrogance and God attacks arrogance. And because of those things, I look at my life and I think, I do not want to be arrogant. If God hates what I'm doing and if God's going to attack what I'm doing, then I must examine my life and ask myself, am I being arrogant? And today in my talk, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be explaining what arrogance looks like and different things for you to look at your life and say, man, am I acting like this? Am I being arrogant? Because I hope that you want to change. So the first thing that you can write down about arrogant people is that arrogant people look down on others. Arrogant people look down on others. Now that's what King Nebuchadnezzar did. If you look back at your Bible in chapter 4, verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar's on his palace. He's walking up, looking over his whole entire kingdom, and this is what he says. He said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Do you see how many times he used a personal pronoun there? Three times. Arrogant people normally use I and my and mine a lot. They care about themselves more because they elevate themselves and they think that they are better than other people. 
You see, Nebuchadnezzar looked down on other people. As he's on his kingdom, as he's walking on his palace, he says, look at everything I've done. Now, the funny thing about that is that he had soldiers that fought his battles for him. He had jail guards that watched the prisoners from war. He had merchants that ran his businesses. He had people that helped him, but he didn't care about them. He elevated himself, and he thought he was better than everybody, and he looked down on them. He was arrogant. And what I would say is that in our lives, oftentimes we can look down on other people, that we think we are better than other people because of who we are, because of the things we've done, because of the things that we're gifted at, we just look down. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I have a lot of different examples here, but oftentimes we, we think we're better than other people because we're smarter than them. I have straight A's. I have a 5.0 GPA. I'm way better than all of you. Now, you might not say that out loud, but you kind of think I'm a little bit better than you. I'm smarter than you. Or I'm more athletic than you. You know, I'm stronger than you. In PE, I'm way better football player than you. And we think we're better than other people. Or I'm prettier than you. I'm prettier than you, so I'm better than you. I'm stronger than you. We, we, sometimes we might think, student leadership kids in here, that I'm better than other people because I'm on salt. I'm better than you. I'm better than you because I'm in the back worshiping. I, I'm better than you because I lift my hands up and worship. I, I'm better than you. I think I'm better than you because I'm white. So I think I'm better than you. And I hope none of you think that, but that's a lot of people in our society, we think that. We think I'm better than you because of all these different things. I'm better than you because I'm a better gamer. I'm better than you because my house is bigger. And I hope most of these, these things don't apply to you, but I bet maybe one or two of those you could see, say that in your life, man, I've kind of thought that. Now, what you need to understand is that it's not bad to think you're better at something than somebody. It's totally okay to think you're better at something because we're all gifted in different ways. If LeBron James came in here and he came on stage and he said, Taylor, I'm better basketball player than you. I'm better at basketball than you. That's not arrogant at all because that is probably true. He's probably way better and I probably he is way better. It's, not, it's just a, it's a fact to say he's better basketball player than me. If you think you're better at something, you probably are. Now, if you're saying it in like a show-offy, bragging way, then that's a different issue. But just stating the fact is not a problem. But it's a problem when you think because of the things you're good at make you better than somebody else. Because they don't. They don't make you better than somebody else. Let me remind you that Jesus came down from heaven and he died for everybody. Everybody. He died for the people you do not like. He died for the people that you think you're better than. He died for everybody. And that shows how valuable we are. But let me remind you, he died for us because of how bad we are. He didn't, if we were good, he wouldn't have to come die for us. We'd be okay. But he came down and he died on the cross because we are all bad. We are all sinful people. That is why he died for us. And that shows how loving he is. Next time you think that you're better than somebody, look at your sins. Look at the sins in your life. And you might say, well, at least I'm not a murderer. The Bible says that all sin is worthy of judgment. It's all, it's all worthy of death. That's why Jesus had to come for us. You see, we are all equal. Everybody is equal. But I love how Philippians chapter 2 challenges our concept of being equal. And Philippians 2 actually says, value others as above yourselves. So yes, everybody's equal. But the Bible says, value other people as even above you. And when somebody's above you, you're looking up at them. You're not looking down at them. I love in John chapter 15, when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, he gets down on his knee and he grabs a towel and he washes their feet. And in doing so, he must look up at people. He must be looking up at them. He's looking up at them in service. We need to be people that are looking up at people in service way more than we're looking down at people. We are not better than anybody. And if you think you are better than somebody, then there is a sign that you are arrogant. That's the first thing Nebuchadnezzar did. Now, the second thing that arrogant people uh, are characterized as is they take advantage of the weak. Arrogant people take advantage of the weak. Let me remind you in chapter 4, verse 27, when Daniel is saying all of these bad things might not happen to you, he says, he says this. He says, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins. And then he says, renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. 
by being kind to the oppressed. You see, he wasn't kind, considerate, or caring to those under him. Now, we just talked about how everybody is equal, and everybody is equal, but our world doesn't get that. Our world, unfortunately, doesn't get that. And because they don't get it, there are people that are marginalized in our society. They're classified as the weaker people. It might be that that homeless person that you see is kind of marginalized. It might be that person that nobody really talks to at school is that person that is marginalized. It might be people that are marginalized by race. It might be people that um, are in your friend group that you are friends with. However, when all your friends are together, they're like on the bottom of the whole food chain, totem pole thing. That they're the one that you're always making fun of when other people are around. Those are the people that are that are marginalized. The people that if they were around you, you would probably be embarrassed that they were with you. Those are the weaker people. And Nebuchadnezzar did not care about them at all. But you see, we need to be people that do care about them. And the weaker people, we oftentimes take advantage of them. We don't want to have anything to do with them unless they can benefit us, unless they can help us. I remember oftentimes uh, being at Roosevelt and there was always like those kids that nobody really talked to. And the only time people would talk to them is when people came up to them and they asked them for lunch money because they forgot their money for the day. That's the only time they would be talked to. You would ignore them. Why talk to them? Oh, but they can give me money. Now I'll talk to them. It's sad. But oftentimes we can take advantage of the weak. We need to be people that don't say, what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? We're weaker than Jesus, and he came down and he served us. He did something for us. Nebuchadnezzar did not get that, and because of that, his kingdom was stripped away. So I just want to challenge you guys that you guys should be looking for those people, and you guys should be letting, giving them a voice, hearing them. Maybe that homeless person, maybe you don't go up and talk to them. Maybe you give them a dollar, but at least maybe you don't act like they don't exist. Maybe you don't just look, you know, maybe at least you could say, hi, have a nice day. Maybe we can at least acknowledge their presence. Maybe the people that we don't talk to at school, maybe we can just go up to them. Maybe we can just share, them our, share with them our lunch. Maybe we could pray for people. A lot of you guys in here are going to have influence in your life someday. You're going to get to a point like Nebuchadnezzar where you had influence on other people. But you see, the purpose of influence is to speak up for those with no influence. It's to let them have a voice. I love Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. It says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. If you ever get to a point where you think, I'm not going to have anything to do with them. Do you know the level I, I'm on? Do you know who I am? I don't talk to those type of people. Well, then you struggle with arrogance, and you are arrogant. Now, the third thing that Nebuchadnezzar did that describes arrogance that we might uh, do is we blow off God. Blow off God. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 through 29, this is when Daniel said, maybe if you change these things, if you start doing what is right, if you start listening to the Lord, then maybe none of this humiliation is going to come to you. Then maybe you can keep your kingdom. And it said that God gave him how many months? 12 months. He gave him a year. He was patient with him. Scripture doesn't say that if he did start following the Lord, then it wouldn't happen to him, but I, I feel like it, it wouldn't. And we could get to points in our lives where we feel like we are so successful that we don't need God. Hey, do you know the grades I have? I don't need God. Hey, I'm going to be a professional athlete someday. I don't need God. I don't need to listen to him. I know the Bible's good. I know that it has different things it wants me to do, but I just listen to those as suggestions. I think I know better than God. And we blow them off. And if you think that you don't need God, you are making yourself God. And that's so arrogant. That is so arrogant. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. And because he did that, because he did these three things, God took him from a place of pride to a place of humiliation. And we're going to see just what happened to him. Let's pick back up in verse 33. It says, 
After Nebuchadnezzar was being prideful, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. God made him into an animal. He made him like an ox. He crawled on all fours and his claws grew long and he ate grass from the ground. You see, it's an actual psychological disorder. It's called boanthropy. Boanthropy, you can Google it when you go home. It's when people think that they are a cow or an ox. Um, It's a real thing. It's a legitimate thing. And I heard that it starts off with uh, you become a vegetarian first and then, I'm just kidding, that's not true. But um, uh, I told that to Tessa last night. But um, yeah, because she is. But boanthropy is a real thing and God humiliated him for seven years, seven years. And now what's awesome is that God restored his kingdom to him because Nebuchadnezzar eventually realized, I'm not God, but I need God. And he looked up and he worshiped the Lord and he prayed to him. To conclude the story in verse 37, it says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he was not humble at all. You guys can write it down this way, be humble or you will stumble. That's what we saw here in the story. I love, though, that by the end of it, King Nebuchadnezzar, remember a murderer, came to know the Lord. And that shows that the evilest people we know, the person in your family that you think will never become a Christian, oh, they can. God can work in their lives. God might even humiliate them until they come to know him. You see, we look at his humiliation as like a mean thing and a messed up thing. God did it out of love here because he wanted him, he wanted Nebuchadnezzar to come to worship him. And this is what you guys need to understand is that you have a choice. You guys can humble yourself now. You guys can start serving other people. You guys can stop thinking you're better than other people. You can start loving people. But if you don't, you will be humiliated God humiliated him by making him like an animal. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to become an ox. I don't. And if God doesn't humiliate you here on earth, this is what's going to happen. Is that you're going to die and you're going to enter the presence of the Lord and in front of God and in front of angels worshiping the Lord, you're going to have to look at God right in the face, even though you won't be able to because you're going to be so ashamed. And you're going to say, God, I thought I was better than you. I thought I didn't need you. And then you're going to be humiliated with all of heaven watching. As God says, are you kidding me? Really? I know it's already up here, but I want you guys to ask yourself, are you willing to humble yourself now or be humiliated later? I hope that you guys don't want to become an ox. I don't want you guys to. I hope that you guys practice humility this week. Be kind to everybody. Love everybody. Pray for everybody. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us so much that you'll even humiliate us so that we can spend eternity with you. God, I pray, Lord, that we can humble ourselves now, that we can listen to you. God, that we can acknowledge that we need you and that we can surrender everything we have to you. God, we love you and we thank you. God, we trust you. It's in your name we pray, amen.